This is a bowling ball attached to a rope and I'm gonna hold it up to my face and let it swing away and swing back. And I'm just going to stay here. Watch what happens. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Hello and welcome to lesson nine of Diana's intro physics class, also known as AP Physics One Review, also known as Physics by Diana. In today's lesson, we're gonna understand why I didn't have to worry about my nose getting smashed off by the bowling ball by understanding the topics of energy and work. So today's theme, work, 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 work. <laughs> energy is such an important concept in physics that we're gonna spend two lessons on it. The question every physics student asks is, what is energy? Ugh. I would normally try to give you some clever explanation, but not with energy. I'm just gonna jump right into a problem to get some intuition. Energy and work. So let's push something. A space cow. It's a cow in space because there's no friction to worry about in space. So say that I have attached a little rocket to her to push her with a constant force of 100 newtons. What's a rocket noise? Okay, so I'm pushing my space cow with a force of 100 newtons. My force equals 100 newtons. So let's turn off the rocket after she goes 10 meters. So the rocket is going pew for 10 meters. Here's the first question. How much work did the rocket do? Okay, wait, we have to define work, at least, for this problem. So work, work has a very specific meaning in physics. Work is a force times a distance. F delta x a force exerted across a distance or across a change in position. And objects lose energy by doing work or they gain energy by having work done on them. So it makes sense. If you exert a force on an object, then you are going to be changing its energy state in some way. And the bigger the distance over you exert the force, the bigger the energy change. So we write that like this work equals force times change in position or work equals force times distance. Now you might ask, why not force times time? Good question. We're gonna do that in lessons 11 and 12. So we'll hopefully get some more intuition for work as we go. Okay, so our rocket force was 100 newtons times our distance. So now we've got the definition of work. Work equals force times distance. Our force was 100 newtons times our distance was 10 meters. So that's 1000 newtons times meters. And now we gotta define the units of work and energy. They actually have the same units, energy and work do. It's not a coincidence, it's because energy comes from doing work, so that's another clue as to what energy is. So units, force comes in newtons, distance comes in meters. So force times a distance, newton meter, and newton meters just sounds weird. So we call a newton meter a joule, a new unit, abbreviated with J. So we've got a new unit, and the joule in joule is named after this English dude who, fun fact, was actually a brewer and not a formally trained scientist. James Prescott Joule in the 1840s, he used electrical generators because they were all the rage. And Mr. Joule wanted to convert his factory, his beer factory, I guess, from steam energy to electrical energy. So to show his investors that it made economic sense, he did all these experiments that revealed the relationships between heat, energy, and work. And that's what, how we got Joule's concepts that we use all the time today in thermodynamics. Interesting. So the rocket did a thousand newton meters or a thousand joules or one kilojoule of work. So that's how much work was done. So now that we've done a problem, we can look back at what energy is. What is energy? Well, the sun seems to have energy. The engine in the jet pack for our cow has energy. Beans and rice, an exploding watermelon, an excited Diana. These things all do have energy, but defining energy, still a little tricky. We want everything to be measurable and quantifiable in physics. So that means the measurable something that can be transferred to an object when you either heat it up or you do work on it. That's what energy is. You're quantifying the heat or the work you do to an object. I feel like energy is so hard to get your head around, but we're gonna keep doing problems with it. So the rocket did 1,000 joules of work, and so now our cow has energy. She's moving. This motion, in a very real sense, is where the work of the rocket went. The motion is the energy. 
and we call it kinetic energy because I exerted one kilojoule of work on the cow and there are no other forces on her, and so she has gained one kilojoule of kinetic energy. Cool. And now I'm going to show you something else cool. We can relate her kinetic energy to her speed. The work done is the force times the distance over which it was done. But force is mass times acceleration. And since we started from rest, then the change in her distance is just 1 half at squared. You know this from the early kinematics lessons. And you know this from Newton's second law. So the work that we put into the cow, which equals the cow's change in kinetic energy, is 1 half times the mass times at quantity squared. But wait, at is just the change in velocity. So this equals 1 half mv squared. So this is a really great example of how in physics we can just put together different mathematical models to get a new one. Like this one, and then, you know, this is one, and this is one, and we get something completely new. Like putting together a drill and scissors to get drizzers. It's terrifying. It's not always a useful combination. But we now have a new tool to calculate the change in kinetic energy from the change in an object's speed, starting from rest. And if you were not starting from rest, then you would write it like this. Change in kinetic energy is 1 half m times my final velocity squared minus 1 half m times my initial velocity squared. Now I want to take a second to point out that it really only makes sense to talk about energy in terms of changes in energy or transfers of energy. But a lot of times we just talk about an object's kinetic energy, like it's absolute energy. And you see this a lot. Like the kinetic energy of an object is 1 half mv squared, period. And that's fine. We're just comparing the kinetic energy to a reference frame where our velocity is zero. For example, say you're getting ready to fling some poo on Earth. In one reference frame looking down from outer space, the poo is already being flung super fast with the Earth's rotation and orbit through space. But you can just choose the reference frame, like maybe our physics lab, where the poo starts out completely still. So, let's use our new tool. Let's use kinetic energy to find velocity. We can find the velocity of our cow after giving her that boost. Kinetic energy equals 1 half mv squared. So I'm trying to find the velocity of the cow given her kinetic energy. And say that we know the cow's mass plus the rocket suit, the rocket spacesuit is 10 kilograms. So I want to solve for v. So I'm going to start with 1 half mv squared. v equals, I'll bring up the 2, so you'll get the square root of 2 times the kinetic energy over m. I know that my kinetic energy is 1,000, so the top is going to become 2,000 joules over 10 kilograms. And that, you take the square root of 200, you get approximately 14 meters per second. But I'm going to do real quick, I'm going to check my units. So a joule is a newton meter, and a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So a newton meter, I need another meter, and I've got kilograms on the bottom. Kilograms cancel, and then I get meters squared per second squared, square root that, and I get meters per second. So if we work in energy instead of kinematics, then our problems are almost always so much easier. So we went to space to escape friction and gravity and all that. But there's actually some really interesting stuff that happens when we think about energy and work in a gravitational field. And lucky for us, I have one handy right here. So in a previous lesson, we were talking about the forces involved while lifting objects in an elevator. So let's revisit this idea of lifting up, but with an energy and work perspective. I'm gonna steadily lift up my cow one meter at a constant velocity. Imagine she's in an elevator. No acceleration, constant velocity. And she's got a mass of 10 kilograms. How much work did I do by lifting her up one meter? Constant velocity. Work equals force times distance. And now what force am I talking about? Quick force diagram. I've got my gravitational force downward. And I know that that is Fg equals mg. m is 10. g is about 10, because it, but it's also down, so it's negative. So that's minus 100 newtons. And then no acceleration means that my force exerted upward must cancel out the downward gravitational force of the cow's weight because my net force 
equals zero. Since my net force is zero, I have to exactly balance that with the force of tension. We'll assume that there's a string or a cable or something on the top of the elevator. And so my string, my cable has a tension, T, and so my force upward has to balance this force, so my tension is 100 newtons. So in the setup of the problem, I gave you this. I said we lifted her up one meter, and 100 newtons times one meter equals my work, 100 joules. So fast. So I did work on the cow just like the one in space, but this time the cow's speed did not increase. Her kinetic energy didn't change. So where did my energy go? This is fascinating. My 100 joules of work got stored in the gravitational field between the cow and Earth. We call this energy stored in the gravitational field the gravitational potential energy. And we can derive a model for this, gravitational potential energy. And a lot of people write that as PE. My force is mg. If I lift a mass in Earth's gravitational field, the force I have to exert is just mg. And then the distance is just the height to which I lift it. That's h. mgh is my mathematical model for my gravitational potential energy. So simple. So beautiful. It's also kind of like magic. Unlike the motion of kinetic energy, you can't really see gravitational potential energy. Where is it? How do I even know that it's there? Well, there you go. It's definitely there. I can hear it and I can see it because that stored gravitational potential energy is able to do work. It might have even broken the cow. Nope, she good. Again, an example of how energy really only makes sense when we talk about transferring energy. And we can use this idea to make some hard problems much easier. Like for example, how fast was the cow moving right before she hit the ground? We could haul out our kinematics equations and start chugging, or we could just write this. I'm setting the gravitational potential energy equal to the kinetic energy because the potential energy we stored as gravity will turn into kinetic energy as it falls. And right before it hits, it will all be kinetic energy. And look, the masses cancel. Yet another proof that objects fall at the same rate, independent of mass. Plug in G, our height, solve, and this is now a one-step problem. Uh, what are we trying to find? Oh, we're trying to find the velocity. A one-step problem to find the velocity. So now plug in g, which is 10 meters per second squared, approximately, 9.81, you know. You know the game, meters per second squared. Our height is one meter, that's what we dropped it from, equals one half v squared, so 20 meters squared per second squared equals v squared. Take the square root and I get v equals approximately 4.5 meters per second. That was so fast. And check it out, just like kinetic energy, potential energy is relative. That h in the mgh is relative to some reference height defined as zero. So often we set zero as the ground, but we just set it to be this table. And the physics still works out even if the table is on the 50th floor of a building. You can set zero to whatever you want because all we're interested in is the changes in energy, like the change of potential energy as the heights change. Okay, some big ideas here. Energy is all about transfer, all about work. And we can keep track of where the energy goes with our new kinetic energy and potential energy tools. But what about situations where we seem to lose energy? Remember the wrecking ball way back in lesson two when the guys from How Ridiculous dropped a wrecking ball onto a trampoline from 35 meters up and then it bounced, but it only went 14 meters back up on the return. So why didn't it reach back to its original height? You might have heard that energy is always conserved. So where did the potential energy go? It didn't just disappear. So look and listen. You can see and you can hear it. The ball transferred a lot of its motion, a lot of its kinetic energy into vibrations in the trampoline itself, which in turn created vibrations in the air carrying the sound. And then those vibrations are kinetic energy. And then eventually the vibrations will dampen out. But that energy has to go somewhere too into the motion of the surrounding air. And some of it gets transferred to the internal kinetic energy of the trampoline's molecules. And those molecules will be vibrating and rotating with a higher kinetic energy. And what do we call transfer of kinetic energy at the molecular level? We call it heat. We can calculate how much energy is lost to heat. 
The difference in the potential energy of the ball before and after the bounce will be the energy lost to heat. So that's going to be the initial potential energy minus the final potential energy. And that's the energy we lost. So it's going to be our MGH initial minus our MGH final. And G doesn't change, M doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the height. And that's going to be our change in energy or our heat. Heat loss. No, potential energy that we lost. So let's do it. Let's do this real world problem. Let's figure out how much energy was lost to heat in this problem. The mass I'll give you of the wrecking ball is about 80 kilograms. Uh, maybe I'll just go ahead and draw this real quick. Here's our trampoline. It started off at 35 meters, so our initial height. And then when it bounced, our final height was 14 meters. And our mass is 80 kilograms. Pulling out the M and the G and writing MGHI minus H final. 80, my M is 80. So that's going to be 80 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared. Why is she suddenly using 9.81 instead of 10, you ask? <laughs> well, actually, this is interesting. Usually I just use 10 meters per second squared because we're, we're teaching concepts. But here, this is a real world problem. So I want to use as accurate of numbers as I possibly can. Okay. Uh, my height difference is 35 minus 14, so that's 21 meters. Do all this math and I get the energy change is about 16,500 joules. Ooh, or 16.5 kilojoules. Kilojoules. Woo, that's a lot. Fun fact. 16 kilojoules is roughly around the same energy as two AA alkaline batteries. This wrecking ball problem reminds me of a similar but much tinier experiment that I did a couple years ago that was really weird, where I dropped a bunch of Tic Tacs and filmed them in slow motion, and it turns out that it's possible for some of them to bounce higher on the second bounce. That seems to defy our models of potential energy that we just worked out. But I figured out that the Tic Tacs were spinning really fast sometimes on the first bounce, and they were actually storing energy as rotational kinetic energy. And then they were bouncing again and kind of unwinding in a sense. As they stopped rotating, and then you can get back some of that energy as potential energy. So I was using these exact concepts to figure out what was going on. And while we're talking about things moving up and down in gravitational fields, I want to stop and think about something new. How I get this cow from here to here. In physics, we call this a path. This path is different than this path, but is it? Think about it for a second. What's the change in potential energy here? In both cases, M is the same, G is the same, and H is the same. So the change in potential energy is actually identical. The path that I take moving in a gravitational field does not matter. This means that gravity is what we call a conservative force. A good way to wrap your brain around this is to think about objects in orbit. Let's put the cow back in space, but this time we're going to go around Earth in a circular orbit. Here's Earth. Here's my cow. Square cow. Mole. And it's going in a circular orbit. So she's feeling a force, a gravitational force, pointing into the center of the circle. And her velocity is at a right angle tangential to that force, so it's this way. So as she moves in the circle, how is her energy changing? It's not. She's moving in a circular orbit, so her height remains completely constant, no matter where she is on the circle. And the force is perpendicular at all times. Here's the force, velocity. At no point does the force act in the direction along the path she's following. So there's no work being done here. So gravity does no work on objects in circular orbits. The International Space Station orbits the Earth once every 90 minutes, with Earth's gravity keeping it in a circle, but gravity transfers zero joules of energy to the International Space Station. Come on! That's wild! It doesn't take any energy or any fuel to keep an object in a circular orbit. Well, I mean, they do actually have to boost it a little bit every once in a while because there's actually a tiny bit of atmospheric drag up there, but like very little. There's actually this really cool video of an astronaut holding his camera while the space station does one of those boosts to get back so up to speed, and it is so cool. There it goes. Uh, well, it actually well, came well. a little bit early. 
Now watch the camera accelerate toward you. There it goes. So gravity is a conservative force. An example of a non-conservative force is friction. Say I want to drag my little cow, for example, along this path, or if I take this path. If there is friction between my cow and the table, which there is, then the path that I take really does matter. Think about it. Friction is always acting against your direction of motion. So the friction force changes direction as I do. I take this way longer path, my delta x times my friction force, which is the total work that I had to do to get my cow from here to here, will be way more if I take a longer path than if I just take this much shorter path. So this is what all your friends are talking about when they keep whining about friction being a non-conservative force. <sighs> all right, that's the basics of energy and, and work. So let's put our new tools together and let's solve a problem. I like the good old box or square cow sliding down a ramp problem because it's a lot of work if you do it kinematically, but it's fast and easy if you use the energy method to solve it. Maybe pass me the slate. So we're gonna slide our cow down this ramp and there's no friction. So it's gonna speed up and speed up and then it hits here, there is friction and it's gonna slow down to a stop. And then we're gonna see how far she slides once we get a force of friction between her and the table. That's our problem. This problem would have been really tricky to solve with kinematics. I would have had to break up the gravitational force into components and figure out its speed at the bottom of the ramp and then think about the normal force acting on the cow and the coefficient of friction. And then I put this all together to figure out how long it takes the friction force to slow the cow down to zero velocity. It takes a while. So let's look at how fast I can solve it using energy. Okay, I'm gonna put my cow on the ramp here and then she's gonna slide some distance. delta x. And this is what I want to find. The cow started with potential energy, mgh, and my h is my height here. And then here, at this point, at the bottom of the slide, all of the energy is converted into kinetic energy. 1 half mv squared. And the cow keeps moving here, and then friction begins to do work to slow it down with some coefficient of friction mu, it's also a given. And then after some delta x, it stops. So the question is, what is this delta x? How far does it go? So when it stops sliding, it has no kinetic energy, no potential energy relative to the table. All of the energy was converted into heat by friction. So the work that was done across here is, is our work, which equals a force, the force of friction times our delta x. And my force is the force of friction, which you remember from the friction lesson is mu, times the normal force, which is mg in this case. There's nothing pushing on the cow. It's just gravity times the mass. So that's mu mg delta x is my work across this part. So it's all converted to heat through friction. That's this work here at the very end. I'm not looking for its velocity here in the middle. I want to know how far it went so I can skip this middle step of kinetic energy. Although if it were a problem asking for the velocity, I would just use these two equations. But we can go straight from here to here. So I'm just going to set this potential energy to this mu mg. So I've got mgh equals mu mg delta x. And the m's cancel. The mass of the cow doesn't matter. Do you see why? The g's cancel. So I'm left with h equals mu delta x. And so the distance that the cow traveled, that's what I'm looking for, remember, is delta x equals h over mu. Whoops, I forgot <laughs> the x <laughs> in the delta x. <laughs> that looks so bad. I want a pretty thing at the end. So I'm just going to redraw it. h over mu. So pretty. That is so simple. Crazy simple. Just by thinking through it energetically, we were able to re reduce this problem to basically one step. And whenever you can, try and solve problems using energy methods because it's usually totally worth it. Whoops. Fortunately, we're done. The delta x is h over mu. I can't believe it was that simple. Cool. That's all of lesson nine. Energy and work. We're going to work more problems about energy in the next video, so save up your energy. And when they ask you today what you learned on YouTube, here are your takeaways. Number one, energy is always about transfer. 
In other words, doing work or heating. And number two, if you can work problems using energy methods, do it. And here are all the problems that we work today. You, you just have to work them again if you really want to understand the physics. So go work them on your own. And also you can search online for more problems in physics 101 about work and energy. And my last fact that I want to share with you today is that we learned about how things can gain energy from zero to a thousand joules or whatever amount you want, but that's not actually true for tiny objects like atoms and electrons. They can only gain and lose energy in very, very specifically sized chunks called quanta, and they cannot have energy in between. That's real. It's true. They're like, they're just stuck to these these levels and quantum of energy. So if you stick with physics, you will learn about the weird rules that apply to tiny objects if you take a class on quantum mechanics. And I do hope you stick with physics. So last thing for you, a message from a special guest. What's up, everyone? I hear you're taking a physics course from the coolest physicist I know, Diana. And I'm stoked for you because I love physics. There's just something so beautiful that you know, we could speak different languages, we could have total different cultural backgrounds. And if we both drop a rock, we would come to the same answer as to how many seconds it would take to hit the ground. It's just a universal language that helps us predict the world around us. And I just, I love it. And I, that's what got me into engineering when I took physics first in high school. I realized there's something here that my brain likes. So I'm excited for you to be starting on that same journey. Good luck. Thank <laughs> you.